I believe, if I'm not mistaken, this congregation has supported me for 28 years financially to do evangelistic work, and that means a great deal to me. Uh, you've been very kind and very generous to me and my family. A lot of visitors here today. We have a study this morning not necessarily designed for visitors, and from time to time as a congregation, we need to study things that pertain to us in the congregation, and we're not trying to leave any of the visitors out. And Perhaps the things we study today will be applicable to you wherever you attend and worship. A question, is this a thriving church? Is this church thriving? Now you may wonder why does the question even matter, because I want to tell you something today, and I believe this with all my heart, I want to go to heaven. Do you want to go to heaven? I want to tell you something. I want the worst scoundrel in Pampa, Texas to go to heaven. I, I want Vladimir Putin to go to heaven. O Osama bin Laden's already gone. I, I, wanted, I want him to go to heaven. I want folks to go to heaven. And the truth is, that's what the church is about. God ordained that there be a church, a group of believers that come together that live together, that work together, that are bound together in fellowship in Christ. And the purpose of that church is to help people to go to heaven. And I'm going to tell you folks, it's rough. It's hard. Life is hard. Unless you're living in a cave, you know that. And what we need right here in Pampa, Texas is for this church to thrive. That's the best shot you have at going to heaven. That's the truth. It's the best chance you have. Churches thrive. You hear, we hear about congregations that thrive. And I'm going to tell you a fact. I can, I can tell you about 40 churches of Christ that have closed in the last 20 years. You know what? That makes me sick. That's sickening. And I could show you a list on one hand or maybe both of congregations that won't last another 5 or 10. They're dying. Why? Did, did God put the church here to die? Or did God establish the church? Did Jesus shed His blood so that it can thrive and that you and I can thrive within it? I'd encourage you to turn to the book of Acts chapter 9 this morning. We're going to read this verse and another one that's very similar and it's probably a verse maybe you've, you've read or noticed but not studied so much. Acts 9, verse 31. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified, and walking in the fear of the Lord, and the comfort of the Holy Ghost, were multiplied. Multiplied. What does that mean about the church? What is he saying about the churches? Were they growing? What does multiplied mean? Does that mean there was one more Christian? Or two more? What does it mean that the churches were multiplied? They were edified. They were learning and they were being built up. Does that mean that there were many more churches and many more Christians? I want to talk to you a little bit about the nature of the church. And I believe the nature of the church is to thrive. And for a church to thrive, then that means you have to thrive. You personally that means you as a family should thrive and grow. That the virtues of Christ should be multiplied within you. And ultimately at some point that there should be more Christians who come here. That this building's every seat taken, every seat full. Isn't that the idea? <clears throat> a parable in Matthew Chapter 13 of our Lord. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds. Tiny little seed. And he goes on to say, But when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs. It becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. This is the nature of the church. 
That's what this parable is. A parable, this means a laying beside. We're going to look at two things and compare these two things. He says the kingdom of God is like a tiny little seed and the nature of a seed is to grow. Is it not? And ultimately one day become a tree. I, I want to tell you something. I've planted a lot of trees. And you know how many trees that live around my house? Tim knows. <laughs> not one. I've dug up trees and I've bought trees and I've planted them. And grant you, I'm not living in the Garden of Eden. I'm living over here in, in the Texas Panhandle. There's not a tree like that. What does it take for a tree like this to thrive? It takes good conditions, doesn't it? It takes good soil. It, it takes water, doesn't it? It takes time for something like that to thrive. But this is the nature of the church, and the Lord used this parable to express to us so that you can understand that the nature of the church is to grow and thrive. It is not the nature of the church to die. The book of Acts, chapter 8, verses 3 and 4, As for Saul, he made havoc of the church. Havoc. He tore up the church. He entered into every house, hailing men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. You know, we've really been very blessed people. We've had, I haven't known anyone here lately who tried to just destroy the church. I've, I've, we've not had a discussion today about this guy who's tearing up the church. We've not had a discussion this morning about any Christians being arrested, thrown in jail, put to death, none of that. We've talked about fire and smoke, and et cetera. That's what we talked about. But the church in its early days, Saul tried to kill it and destroy it. He fought against it. He was the enemy of the church. And I want you to notice in particular, they went everywhere preaching the word. Now I want you to know just... Just a little bit later, Acts 9, 31, that puts it into perspective. The churches had rest. This persecution ended. The churches had rest. What happened? They were edified. They walked in the fear of the Lord. What, who is that? The church, the people, walked in the fear of the Lord in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, and they were multiplied. Now, Acts chapter 16, I want to read verses 4 and 5. As they went through the cities, they delivered to them the decrees to keep, which were determined by the apostles and elders at Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. What makes a church thrive? I believe it's very simple. And I'm just going to tell you honestly, in my time as serving as an evangelist, the, the last 28 years, people come to me and say, what can we do to help our church? What do we need to do? And I think a lot of folks wanted some magical, just do this and it'll grow. I believe it's pretty simple. You need two things. You need godly leadership and you need highly active members. It's, it's two things. And so we read, and thank you, Brother John. Jesus gave apostles, which we don't have anymore. To be an apostle, you had to see the resurrected Christ. And Christ has gone back to heaven, and nobody laid eyes on him for a long, long time. He gave apostles and prophets. We no longer have prophets. That, that miraculous work within the New Testament, has, has gone away. We don't have prophets any longer. Then he says, evangelists, some pastors, the word pastor simply means elder, and teachers. We have these three offices, you might say, evangelists, elders, and teachers. What are they for? For the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. These are here to help people to thrive, to help churches to grow so that churches can be edified. And that's a little bit of a theme that we've noticed here from Acts chapter 9. The people were edified. The decrees were taught to the people. And in those days, those Christians received that teaching. 
They were built up and edified. They listened to the words of the apostles and prophets, the elders from Jerusalem, and guess what? They got busy and they went to work, and those churches thrived. They grew. And I'm going to tell you what a cancer is in the church today. Worldliness. We get all caught up in the world. I, all of us. All of us. Do you think you could go anywhere in America and find out, find, ask somebody uh, who's playing in the Super Bowl and somebody not know? I, I, 99% of us all know. There might be one or two people who wouldn't know. We all keep up on things of the world. Now, I'm not here to throw stones at you and tell you that, that it just can't be that way. But I'm going to tell you one of the reasons churches don't thrive is because we don't have good leadership or we don't have highly active members. And that's just a fact. We go on to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16. From whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies. I'm going to stop right there. Every person who's here that's a part of the church supplies something. Every person. From, from the smallest child to the oldest man, we provide something. Every person is a joint that supplies movement, it supplies activity, it supplies strength to the body. And he goes on to say, according to the effective working by which every part does its share. You know what one of my jobs is in the house? Take out the trash. Take out the trash. And you know what? My wife won't do it. I don't know how deep it'd pile up. She ain't taking it out. It's my job. So I do it. I bag it up. I take it out. It's a small thing. It's got to be done. You ever been into a house where nobody take out the trash? It ain't very nice. You're not going to thrive. It's a small thing, isn't it? But you as people and as individuals all provide something that's necessary for the church to grow and thrive. For it to work. We need elders. We've got to have that. You know what? We need every person to sing. We need that. We, meet, we need people to communicate with their neighbors and visit with their neighbors. Be good to their neighbors. Be kind. Take them a meal. Go help them uh, mechanic on their car. Go, go help them in some way. We need members of the church engaging with other people because everybody has a part as a share that ultimately will cause the growth of the body. Each person contributes to the production of the whole. Each and every person works together to produce the end result, which is growth. Personal growth, family growth, spiritual growth, growth in numbers. New Christians, new families. That's the idea. The churches were multiplied. Those churches were growing. And we can sit around and say, well, they lived in a different time. They lived in a better time. Maybe all that's true. I don't know, but I want to tell you something. Nothing has changed. The people still are being born and the people are still dying. People still need to know about Jesus. And people still need to learn about the Lord and go to heaven. People, it still matters today. I want to go to heaven. Don't you? I want my wife to go to heaven. I want my three children to go to heaven. I, I've got three grandchildren. I want them to go to heaven. It doesn't just end right there. I've got a neighbor across the street. I want him to go to heaven. So what makes a church thrive? For a church to thrive, no one can be idle. No Christian is useless. For a church to thrive, you must all contribute. And if someone is not doing their share, only two things can happen. One, someone is overworked. Someone's overworked. Or two, production will be limited. That's just a fact. Churches thrive 
when the membership and the leadership embrace the work and work hard. There is no magic pill. I think a lot of people felt like Facebook was the magic pill. We'll put our church on Facebook and people will hear about our church and they'll, it's not a magic pill, is it? It may, it may be one little element. You know what? Good singing. Really helpful. It's important. It is not the magic pill. Good teaching. Very important. It's not I'm going to tell you, folks, it's all of it. You ever go to a church where no one's friendly? I'm going to tell you, friendliness is important. I went to a church one time, nobody would talk to me. I looked around, I thought, do I stink? What, what is wrong with me? I'm a people per what? Those things, all these things matter. Little things matter. Somebody writing a note and sending a card to someone who's sick, it matters. Having a Bible study once a week, it matters. Because we need to learn. We need other people to learn and to grow. That's a, it's a hard ordeal, folks. Heaven or hell, it's in our hands. And not just for you, it's for those that are around you. So I have something to say to you, and I'm going to say it. Strongly and firmly, if you do not know what you need to do, you need to go ask your elders. Go to your elders and say, what can I do? What can I do to help this church grow? And I'm going to tell you, they're going to have an answer for you. We need this or we need that. And there is not one single person who's a member of this church who is exempt. Some of it's on you because you are a joint, you're a part of this church, you are a member, and some of it's on you. And the better you do, the more active you are, the stronger we are together as a whole. That's just a fact. So I want, to talk, I want to change gears just a minute and talk a little bit about the work of the church. And some of these things I know you're very familiar with, so I want to refresh you. The apostle said in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 6, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. We're a team. We're not all planters. We're not all waterers, are we? Not everyone here today can do a Bible study. That's okay. It's okay. Not everyone here today is an elder. That's all right, too. Not everyone here today can lead songs. It's very true. It's okay. We all have different abilities, and we need to use those abilities. Notice what he says in verse 7. Neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that give the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor, for we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. I want to ask you a question. If as a church, we all work together, and we plant and water, and 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 plant and water, will God give the increase? Yes. Yes. People say, what can I do to make my church grow? Plant water. Work. Take time to go stop and talk to your friends and neighbors. Talk to your co-workers. Talk to them about the Bible. Talk to them about Jesus. Use your relationships and use your influence to plant the seed of the Word of God and then water that seed and repeat and repeat and repeat and God will give the increase. And then in a very real sense, this is... The work of the church. Do you know what? Somebody planted and watered me. My parents. My grandparents. Jerry McCorkle, one of them. Took time, talked to me, encouraged me. 
made a difference. That's true for every person here. Every person. Murtis has had to set people do that for her many years ago to plant and water and take time and talk to her and care for her, build a relationship with her and give her strength. That's true for every person here. Every person here. Many years ago, our family was not a part of the church. We weren't Christians. My great-grandfather left Jacksboro, Texas and moved to, of all places, Loco, Texas. People say we're crazy. We're from Loco. Okay? And when he crossed the Red River, it was a one-lane bridge in those days, and there was a vehicle setting because only one car could go at a time. And he stopped and visited with this gentleman. And this fellow said, are y'all looking for work? And my great grandfather said, yes, we are. He said, I can put you to work. He said, do you need a place to live? And he said, well, yes, we do. He said, I have a place you can live. And this man's name was John Devonport, member of the church in Loco, Texas. And he saw my great-grandfather, and he saw an opportunity to plant and water. And he'd give him a job. He'd give him a place to live. And my great-grandfather would go out in the field and plow a field with a team of horses. And John Davidport would come out and say, Dave, those horses look tired. You should let them rest. He'd open the Bible. And he'd, he'd study with my great-grandfather. My great-grandfather went home to his wife, Minnie, and said, he's wrong. He's wrong about this stuff. And he said, I'm going to prove him wrong. And he developed an attitude to study, albeit to show a man wrong, and ultimately he became a Christian. Dave Dukes, my great-grandfather, his wife, Minnie, all five of their children, all the grandchildren, all the great-grandchildren. That man changed the course of our family in just a few minutes. And that, my friends, is planning and watering. Planning and watering. What makes people plant and water? Book of Luke, chapter 10, verse 27. He answered and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I want people to go to heaven. Don't you? Don't you? Then go talk to your neighbor. Go talk to your neighbor. Now your neighbor, your neighbor may say, get out of my house. <laughs> he may say, leave me alone. It's, it's okay. But we got to take opportunities when they're there to plant and water. <clears throat> the book of Mark chapter 6 verse 21. Where your treasure is there will your heart be also. This is the problem with worldliness. Because worldliness just comes in and takes up all our time. And we'd say I just don't have time to go talk to them. I'll go talk to them later. I don't have time to go visit this person in the hospital. I'll do that later. Well, what if John Devonport didn't have time to stop and talk to my great granddad? Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. This is an illustration on if you have a problem in your eye. And if your vision's blurry, then you can't see. Your eye's not full of light. But if your eyes are sound, if you've got good eyes, you can see. And your whole body's full of light. He says in verse 23, But if thy eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. No man can serve two masters. No man. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. We cannot serve Jesus Christ and serve the world. We cannot serve our Lord Jesus and all, all of our time be taken up in worldly things. It is will not work it will not work for you personally it will not work for your family and it will not work for the church it can't 
Jesus said, lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth. <coughs> Don't do that. Plant and water with your friends and neighbors and gain treasures for heaven. Treasures for heaven. Where moth and rust doth not corrupt, where thieves do not break through and steal. Now I want you to turn to the book of Acts chapter 28. If you have a Bible, open, this, open your Bible and read this. It's just a couple of verses. But I'll tell you, this is everything we've been talking about all summed up in one example. Now, this is the Apostle Paul. And you can sit there today and go, well, Paul, yeah, he was an apostle and he was a brilliant, all that. I'm going to tell you something. Paul was just a Christian. He was someone who loved other people. And he was striving to make a difference and those about him. I want you to notice what it says in verse 23. When they had appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging. This is Paul. Paul was out talking with people. He was visiting with people. And he says to the people, why don't you come sit down and let's discuss the scriptures. Let's talk about the scriptures. And they said, well, when? He said, well, Friday at 6. Or, or Tuesday at 8. I don't know. It doesn't make any difference. He... He appointed a day, they made an appointment, and they came to his house. That's what this verse says. To whom he expounded and testified of the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning till evening. They didn't have a one-hour Bible study. They had an all-day Bible study, didn't they? Notice what he says in verse 24. Some believe the things which were spoken and some believe not. And I want to tell you, nothing has changed. Nothing. If you will visit with your friends and neighbors and communicate to them about your beliefs, if you'll talk to them about the Bible, share some scriptures, invite them to church, ask them to sit down and study. Some will do it. Some will come and sit down and study the Bible. Some won't. Some will stay all day. And some will believe. Some won't. And you know what we have to do? Repeat, repeat, and repeat. I don't know how many people John Davenport stopped at the bridge. Bound to be a few. Probably many said, no, thank you. Not interested. And maybe you're here today and you're saying, I can't do a Bible study. I want to tell you, there's a number of good people here who can do that, both men and women in this congregation who can help you do a Bible study. We all have different talents and abilities, and we need to use them. <clears throat> Titus 2, verse 14, Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Now, this word peculiar doesn't mean we're a bunch of weirdos. I've heard it said from the pulpit that is not correct. We're not to be a bunch of weirdos. The word peculiar means special. It means purchased. We have been bought with the blood of Jesus. We are a peculiar people. We are special to God uh, because his blood has cleansed us. That's the idea in this passage. But I, I've got off track a little bit. We ought to be a people zealous of good works. Zealous. Zealous. To make a difference in someone's life. What makes churches thrive? I'm going to start my conclusion. It's a little longer conclusion than sometimes. and there's, So you may think, well, he ain't trying to wrap it up, but I am. Uh, I don't want to talk to you about the church at Rome. And so if you want to get out your Bible, turn to the book of Romans chapter 16. I'm not certain all these people were at Rome, but that's my feeling. I feel like most of these people were at one church in Rome. And I want to just talk to you about some of these people uh, for a little bit. And there's some hard names and I'll probably goof them up, but that's just how it goes. Romans chapter 16, beginning in verse 1. I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister. I don't know a lot about Phoebe. Do you? I, I don't really know much, but I do know this. The Bible says, which is a servant of the church, which is at Chinchria. She served the church. What'd she do? I don't know. I don't know. I, you can just let your mind wonder about that. That you receive her in the Lord has become a saint, that you assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you, for she hath been a succorer of many and of myself also. Paul says, Phoebe was a lady that really tried to help the church. She comforted people, evidently. 
And so maybe that means she took them a meal. Maybe she cared for them when they were sick. Maybe there were people who were persecuted and had to leave their homes. She took them in. I don't know, but I do know this one thing. She was the kind of lady who, when the Apostle Paul described her, she's a servant of the church. That's the first one, Phoebe. Verse 3, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus. Well, I've heard about Priscilla and Aquila. They heard a guy preach. And he didn't really know what he's talking about. And they said, hey, we need to talk to you. Come and they talked to that preacher and they taught him the truth. So Priscilla and Aquila are pretty involved people. They were people who had enough confidence and knowledge of the scripture to go talk to a preacher and say, I don't think what you're teaching is right. Now I've noticed verse 4. Who have for my life laid down their own necks. Love the church. They love Paul. They were willing to sacrifice not just what they had, but their own lives, if that were the case. Now I want you to notice, he says, Unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. These people, Aquila and Priscilla, had really made a difference in the church. Verse 5, Likewise greet the church that is in their house. Salute, salute my well-beloved Epaphanatus, who is the first fruits of Achaia unto Christ. It sound like people who are highly involved in the church. Verse 6, greet Mary who bestowed much labor on us. Don't know how there are several Marys in the New Testament. I don't know which one this was. But I do know Mary did a lot of work and evidently helpful to Paul and the apostles. So what you're finding here, you'll notice, is a theme of activity. These members, these people who are part of the church were highly active people. They were working to help the church grow in a number of areas. Uh, Romans 16, verse 7, uh, Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen, my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles who were also in Christ before me. Andronicus and Junia were evidently locked up for being Christians because Paul describes them as fellow prisoners. And they were out working and they were very well acquainted with the apostles. Now verses 8 and 9, Greet Amphilus, my beloved in the Lord. Salute Urbane, our helper. In Christ and Statius, my beloved. These again are people we don't really know. We don't read about them. They're not in every book of the Bible. I'll tell you what sums up their life. Beloved in the Lord. They were people who were highly involved in the church. Were they out talking to other preachers? Probably not. Urbane is called our helper. He was someone who aided in the work of the church. Now verse 10 Salute Apelles, approved in Christ. Salute them which are of Aristobulus household. Salute Herodian, my kinsmen. Greet them that be of the household of Narcissus, which are in the Lord. Again, a list of Christians who were involved in the daily working of the church and in telling others about Christ. Uh, verse 13, salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord and his mother and mine. Salute a Syncretus, Philegon, Hermas, Patrobus, Hermes, and the brethren which are with them. Salute Philologus and Julia, Nereus and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints which are with them. Salute one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. These people, who are they? Who are they? They're, they're no different than you and I. They're Tim and they're John. See, they're Karen. They're Shannon. They're Aaron. They're, they're just common people. They're Caleb. They're just people. They didn't go to school, they weren't trained. They loved the Lord. And they loved the church. And just like you and I, they wanted to go to heaven. So what did they do? They worked. They denied themselves, other joys and other pleasures and other comforts so that they could try to make a difference in people's life. And brethren, if you want this church to thrive, that must be you. It must be you. Who was working? church that's who was working 
And I go from congregation to congregation, and a lot of people say, can, can you get an evangelist to move here, or, or this or that or the other? I would, Folks, it's not the answer. The answer to the church thriving is you. Individually, collectively, work together and make a difference in someone's life. Colossians chapter 2. This is a parallel passage to Ephesians chapter 4, 11, and 12, basically. Now, this first verse, 18, is not, but 19 I'll bring on the screen here in just a minute. Let no man beguile you of your own reward in a voluntary humility or worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. And not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands, having nourishment ministered and knit together, increaseth with the increase of God. It's just like Ephesians 4. It's just like it. If we'll all work together, you have a great deal of strength in this congregation. You have every person who's here has a multitude of talents and abilities. Now, you know what the fact is? The storms of life, they come and go, don't they? Challenges and heartaches and troubles, that, that's true for all of us. We get sidetracked along the way. But I want to tell you, folks, the best chance you have to go to heaven is to be a part of a thriving church. Now, I want to close this up by telling you a, a personal story. I sat down and, and, uh, with a lady, and we got to visiting, and she asked about my daughter, uh, Cheyenne, and, and we was just talking. And Anyway, she, uh, she said, I was going to this church, and I just wasn't getting what I was needing, so I got to thinking about that, and I just left. I quit that church so I could get what I needed, which sounds very logical, doesn't it? And then we got to talking about my daughter, and I said, well, she's moved in a congregation that's struggling a little bit, but they're determined to make it better. They're not just going to leave and find some other place. They want to make it better. They want to help it to grow. They want to make a difference. And I'll tell you, these are very, two very different views. You could come to a place like this and go, well, I, they don't have... X, Y, and Z that I'd like to have, so I'm just going to go somewhere where I can find it. Or you can come to a place like this and go, I will supply X, Y, and Z and make a difference and make it better. It's two vastly different attitudes. And I will tell you today, an attitude matters. Okay? Your attitude matters. How you approach these things with an attitude of teamwork, with an attitude of love, with an attitude of not getting beat down because the challenges are going to come and the hard times will come. They will come. We can have a defeatist attitude and say, well, it just won't work. It won't matter. It doesn't I, I see people all the time. They tell me it doesn't matter if you talk to people. Nobody wants to come to church. That's not true. Would you believe there's been nearly 50 people obey the gospel this year? This year! And in the last six or seven years, we've had almost 1,500 people obey the gospel. People, it still works. The gospel works. We just got to tell it to people. We've got to teach people. We've got to be good friends and neighbors and engage them. We've got to help people to overcome the trials of life so that they can thrive. Is this a thriving church? You know what? It's up to you. It's up to you. Now you're intelligent people. We got a song we're going to sing. Invitation. I want to tell you about the invitation. What is an invitation? Somebody wants you to come, don't they? Come do something. This invitation, we have at every service every service but you know what every time it is a genuine invitation genuine Jesus invites you to come if you're weary come if you're broken hearted come if you're hurting come 
I want to tell you something, folks. If you're lost, come. If you're not the person you ought to be, if you've got caught up in the world and you haven't been working to serve the Lord, to make it to heaven, come. That's the idea. Come. I'm not here today because I've got all the answers. I'm here today just to give you the message. And the message is from our Lord Jesus. Come. Come unto me. He says. All you who are weary. All who you labor. Come. That's what he says. And so we've got a few minutes while we're going to sing this song. and Dwell in your heart. Evaluate in your mind. Do you need to come? If so, come. Are you hurting? Then come. If you need a change, my friend, why don't you come as we sing?